Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pacific Parkland's fifth of six bedtime nature stories. I know that there are a lot of kids and parents out there tonight. I don't know how many of you are new, but I do know that a lot of you are coming back. Uh, and so next week is our last week. Um, today, our storyteller is Lisa. She's a Metro Vancouver Regional Park interpreter, and she is in the East area. Um, and she has a very special time for us tonight, I know. So before we get started, oh, hello, Sam. I recognize that name. Um, before we get started and before we introduce Lisa, I, I just will introduce myself as usual. My name is Janet Antonio and I'm the Executive Director of the Pacific Parklands Foundation. I love parks. I love nature. When my kids were little, I loved introducing them to, to the parks as well. And I have the best job in the world because my job is to help make our regional parks as best as they can be and help connect people like yourself to nature. And um, so every week, I like to start off with an acknowledgement of the land that we live in. And today, behind me, you can see that there's a house. And this is, in fact, a real house that is in Burnaby Lake. It's a beautiful heritage home called um, Aintree House that was built by Mr. and Mrs. Picken over 100 years ago. And 100 years ago, when Mr. and Mrs. Picken brought their daughter from the um, East Coast, they, they came in a car and they had a little hammock where the little girl slept. Um, so it was 100 years ago, and that's hard to imagine. But even before they came, long before they came. There were plants here, animals here, and people here as well. And those were the um, Coast Salish First Nations. And so everyone who lives in Metro Vancouver, and every time we visit the parks, we are on the, the traditional territorial lands of the Coast Salish people. And so we always love to, to express our appreciation and our respect uh, that we can share this land with everyone. So, we are going to get started very soon. Uh, Lisa, if you can join me, we'll uh, introduce you and get you started on your story today. And I love, last week was hummingbirds and this week is woodpeckers. So our, and we've had squirrels, we've had all sorts of animals. So Lisa, I will turn it over to you and I will disappear until the end of the uh, show. Bye for now. Hello everyone. Now, if you hear a voice in the background, Jeff is also here and uh, he's going to help me out with the technical side tonight. I'm so happy you're here with me, my friends. We've got lots to discover tonight and I just want to assure, assure everyone, even though it says 2020, we're not doing 2020 over, it is 2021. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all sitting in our warm, cozy homes. Some of you might be in a house, some of you might be in a high rise like this. And I want you to think about your house. I want you to look around and think how grateful you are to have a roof over your head. Now, if you can type in the chat one thing that you love about your home, one thing that makes it special to you. And I'm going to ask Jeff to share three or four of those answers. Okay, I'm waiting. Oh. Let's say I'll just do the, maybe the first four. So hi, I'm Jeff. I'm like the Wizard of Oz. I'm in the background. You can't see me, but I'm controlling some some of the technical things here. Okay, so two people said toys. Uh, one person said warmth. Um, and oh, somebody said their kitties. So do you want more? Let's see. Then also they said a roof and their TV. Oh, Zoe said her TV. Okay. That's great. Is that so enough for you right that, now? That's fine. Yeah, we all have oh, things plants, in our puppies. Nice. So our homes keep us safe and dry and warm. It's where we store our food and our supplies. And it's the same in the forest. So in the forest, this is what a high rise might look like. Have any of you seen one of these? So this tree, it has a lot of holes in it. And it's like an apartment building in the forest. Sometimes these trees are still alive, sometimes they're dead, but we like to call them hollow trees, roost trees, cavity trees, den trees, snags, or even wildlife trees, because a lot of creatures move in. Now these trees, 
Some of them, they might get hit by lightning, they might get old, they might be diseased. There's all kinds of reasons why a tree starts to get holes in it. And let's see who lives in these forest high rises. Maybe you know some of them. So lots of animals and wildlife use these trees. It's prime real estate out there. And when a tree has a hole like that, we call it a cavity. It doesn't mean the tree has to go to the dentist. It means there's a hole. So does anyone know the name of this bird? And if you know, you can type it in the chat. It sings chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. So that's a little okay. songbird. Oh, yeah, people are getting it. Good. So it is a chickadee. Chickadee, they, yeah, yeah. They use tree cavities for their homes. We also have owls. This is a saw wet owl, and it makes a call that sounds like boop, 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 boop. There's also pygmy owls and barred owls. They use tree cavities. Let's see who else lives here. Oh, does anybody know who that mammal is? Any guesses? Anybody want in the, oh, somebody said a spider, brown bat, bat, okay. It's a little brown bat. So bats will use tree cavities. Let's see who else. Oh, it's a little swallow. So songbirds, like the tree says swallow or the Pacific wren, they like tree cavities. And who's this guy? Super squirrel? Anyone know? Has anyone seen one of these? They only come out at night. Oh, people are getting it, yeah. It's a northern flying squirrel. Yeah. And yeah. other mammals like, believe it or not, deer mice, voles, they'll climb all the way up into a tree cavity. We also have raccoons, mink, weasels, bobcats, all kinds of different mammals that use wildlife trees. And diving ducks, believe it or not. This beauty, a wood duck. Now, when its chicks are ready to fledge, they'll pop out of that tree and drop 20 feet to the ground and waddle to the lake or the stream, wherever they're going to get in the water. We also have mergansers, golden eyes, buffle heads. They'll use holes in trees. And lastly, we have insects like this beautiful morning cloak. There's also ants, beetles, honeybees. They all use tree cavities. So, 16% of BC's wildlife will use these trees with holes for either food, shelter, or nesting. And 31 different kinds of animals will use tree cavities, but here's the trick. None of them make their own holes. Hmm, that's a mystery. I think before I introduce you to the builder, I need to put my safety equipment on. Safety first, people. Are you ready? Let's meet the builder. Did you see what just happened there? That's a woodpecker. And they're master carpenters. They are what we call a keystone species. And that means if these woodpeckers weren't around, the forest would kind of, a lot of animals would be without their homes. Because what this woodpecker does is it flies in and it starts to pound on the tree. I don't want to get in the way there because this bark is like skin it's like our skin it protects the tree from disease it keeps all the liquids all the water and the sap inside the tree it's like our skin so the woodpecker she'll drill this big hole she'll hammer away and then she'll fly away and she'll leave that hole for a month and she'll let the wood get nice and soft because fungus will move in and start to rot the wood and then she'll come back. And when that wood's soft, then she'll really start to dig 
and she has an easier job. So the fungus is kind of her friend and it helps her make a big hole. So these guys are, we talked about this. These guys are really, do you need a timeout? Okay, she's gone. So these guys are key to the forest health. And let's start with a question here. If you wanna pull those questions up, Jeff, let's see what my audience here, what's your experience with woodpeckers? How many of you have seen a woodpecker drumming on metal, hammering into a tree, climbing up a tree, or making a strange call. Most people have seen them hammering into a tree, climbing, making a strange call. Okay, let's have a listen. We're gonna close that poll. So I've got some sounds here. I think what that woodpecker is saying is either, get off my lawn, it's protecting its territory, or it's calling its mate, and it's saying, over here, honey, there's lots of bugs. Let's listen to another sound. Hmm. Okay. I don't think you'd get that sound from hammering on wood. You get that sound when you're hammering on metal. And when woodpeckers, sometimes you'll see them on a stop sign or you'll see them at the top of a metal pole and they're hammering on the pole. That's all about this. Hey ladies, look at how handsome I am. Come on over. They want to attract a mate. So they get up there and they make this big noise. Let's see what this last sound is. <laughs> now if you hear that in the forest we're in trouble because that's not a local species that's woody woodpecker maybe some of you grew up with woody i did he's one of my favorites okay so woodpeckers are pretty amazing they are built for clinging and hammering they're like no other bird. Let's look at our first specimen here. Now, this is our smallest woodpecker. This is a little downy and he has a short little bill, but if you look at his bill, he's got feathers over his nose and that's to keep the wood chips out because he doesn't want to breathe in sawdust. And look at his coloring. He's black and white. And that black and white coloring, it breaks up their shape. So if they're hammering on a tree and they're focused on that, if a predator comes by like a hawk, it's harder to see that woodpecker on the tree. So the black and white helps break up the shape. And I can think of a few other animals that have black and white coloring like skunks or orca whales. The woodpeckers, a lot of them are black and white. Ooh, this is another kind of woodpecker. And I know it's a male because he's got a red mustache right there. And he has this amazing chisel-like beak. He's a good dad, he's feeding his babies. And this chisel-like beak, it's self-sharpening. And he uses it to cut into the tree. And that beak, it will strike the wood at more than a thousand times the force of gravity. I don't know what that would feel like, but it seems pretty impressive. So they also have extremely strong necks and that's for the hammering. And also in their brain case, the way the bones are, it's like a bike helmet. It absor absorbs the impact so they won't get injured. So I'm gonna take off my safety equipment now. So they're built for hammering. And look at his feet. He has two toes that point upwards and two toes that point downwards and it allows him to cling to the bark. And on his back end, he has these amazing tail feathers. 
it's almost like a kangaroo tail. It props him up so he can hang on that tree. And he has a very strong, I hate to say it, but his bum muscles are strong because that's where those feathers are attached. Now woodpeckers, because they're going for insects and bugs in the bark, they have an extremely long tongue. So if I was a woodpecker, I might have a tongue that's five inches long. That's a lot of tongue. It would be like having a gigantic fruit roll up in your mouth all the time. So to get around that, these guys have come up with an amazing adaptation. Their tongue is actually wrapped around their brain case and they have this bone here that when they need to use their tongue and get into the bark and get into those cracks and crevices, they push the tongue out with a bone that's right here and it goes all the way out. And the tongue is kind of sticky and it might have barbs on it and that helps them catch bugs. So, they're amazing creatures. Now this is my favorite. This is the strong man of the woodpecker world. Again, this is a male because he's got the red. Females don't have the red right here. Pileateds are very strong. They will peck away and dig the biggest holes of any of our woodpecker species. The other species of woodpeckers, they'll only come and they'll pick bugs off the surface of the bark. They won't make big holes like this. And what the pileatids do is they act like a can opener. They open up the tree so other creatures and other woodpeckers can get in there to get food. And when the pileatids, when they come together in the spring and they do their little love dance, they always make a new cavity, a new hole. And that makes homes for other animals once they're done with it. They pick healthy trees, which is unusual because that wood's really hard to work with. And they want to use healthy trees because they want to have a tree that's not going to fall down. And those trees are really warm in the cold nights and they're cool in the hot summer days. So they're well insulated. Time for another question. I don't, I think this one might be easy. We'll pull it up. Uh, there we go. Okay. Do woodpeckers eat wood, small children, or <laughs> ants, insects, and bugs found in rotting wood? You're right. They eat ants, insects, and bugs, but they also eat sap. They eat nuts. They eat berries. They eat seeds. So mostly insects, though. So thank you, Jeff. Okay. There we go. I want you to think about what you had for dinner. And if you were a woodpecker, this is what you would have for dinner. Mmm, bark beetles, a little bit of ants on the side, maybe some spiders, delicious protein. Now what's important is these woodpeckers, they actually control insects that might be a problem, like those bark beetles. And even in the winter time, because woodpeckers hang around all winter, they'll be eating bugs and that keeps our forests healthier. Okay. Let's look at some holes here. Hmm. So, pileated woodpeckers, the strong guys, they like to make rectangular holes. Sap suckers make it look like a machine gun has gone across the bark. And they're drilling those little holes to make sap wells so they can drink sap. So, who thinks the one on, which one's, which side is the pileated hole? If you wanna type in the chat, let's see if a few people can get it right. Okay, I'll wait for a few more people, but we got two votes for right. Oh, everybody's saying right. Excellent, you passed the test. So next time you see a big rectangular hole in a tree, you can say with certainty that was affiliated. You can impress all your friends and neighbors. All right, here's a few of our other woodpecker friends. We've got the northern flicker here. Lovely bird. You'll see it in lawns. It likes to feed on the ground. It loves ants. We also have the red-breasted sap sucker. That's the one who digs the sap wells. Important for other species like hummingbirds, 
and insects that will go and drink that sap and other woodpeckers. And we also have a hairy woodpecker here. And you can tell the difference between the hairy and the downy because his bill is as wide as his head. And they're a little bit bigger than the downy. So those are some other woodpeckers that hang around. All right, now I want you to think back to about 90, mid 80s. There was a really good band called Kiss. And I kind of think maybe Gene Simmons from Kiss is half woodpecker. Let's take a look. There he is in all his glory. And I'm going to ask you a question. Does Gene Simmons have woodpecker adaptations? So take a close look at that photo. Oh. That's okay. Does he have black and white coloring? Disruptive coloring like the woodpecker? Does he have a long tongue? Does he have weird feet for climbing trees? And does he love headbanging as a hobby? Let's see what you think. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> All righty. We're gonna circle round back to that idea. But first, I wanna tell you a story. And I wrote this story because I couldn't find any stories about woodpeckers, believe it or not. Once upon a time, there was trouble in the forest. There was a housing shortage. Nights were cold and all the furry, feathery, scaly creatures were getting worried. Why is the meeting? What will we do? asked Salamander. Bear, you're big and strong. I've seen your den under that stump. You can dig us a whole bunch of dens. A lot of us could move in. Bear replied with a shake of her shaggy head. I don't have time for that. I need to fatten up for winter. And she shambled away. Rabbit piped up. I think beaver should start making lodges for everyone. We could hole up under all those logs and wait out the winter. She works fast. We'd have to swim out to the lodge, but I bet it's cozy and warm in there. Nope, Beaver said. I've got to put up food stores and gather my twigs and greens. Most of you can't swim. Besides, Spider is the best builder here. I've heard her silk is as strong as steel. Spider spoke in a tiny voice. You have to be joking. I'm not big enough and I'd run out of silk. It wouldn't be fair to put all that work on me. As the animals argued into the night, there seemed to be no answer. Finally, a bizarre voice broke through the ruckus. Waka 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 about me. I'm a good excavator. I like making holes. I can help. When everyone saw it was Woodpecker, they laughed. For they all thought he was silly with his crazy call and weird habit of eating bugs. You'd get too distracted by ants and termites, said Coyote. At this point, the animals were fed up and started to drift away. Owl pulled Woodpecker aside and gave him a gentle pat. <laughs> Your friends are speaking out of worry and fear. Don't let their doubts erode your good ideas. Over the next week, the animals awoke to this sound. Everybody make a noise. Everybody tap out there. They looked up in puzzlement. What is that? And on the seventh day, the noises stopped. And all the animals looked up in amazement, for Woodpecker had created dozens of holes. When they saw what he had done, they were ashamed for making fun of him. For he had made tree cavities, which became homes for the flying squirrel, the chickadee, the bats, the owls, and many more. 
To this day, you'll recognize him by his red hard hat, his badge for working hard. For when we do what we love, beautiful things can happen. Okay, we are going to finish with a song. Now, I can't hear you, but I want you to sing as loud and proud as you can. And this is to the tune of Kiss's song, I Was Made for Loving You. So, do 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 Hit it. I was made for hammering hard with my shock absorber skull protecting me. Five-inch tongue wrapped around my brain case, probing for bugs in the bark of trees. Once more. I was made for hammering hardwood, my shock absorber skull protecting me. Five-inch tongue wrapped around my brain case, probing for bugs in the bark of trees. And that is it, my friends. I want you to stay curious. Get out in nature as much as you can. It's a wide, wonderful world out there. Lisa, thank you so much. I actually had no idea that uh, woodpeckers' tongues were so long and how and the mechanics for it. Um, we did have just one question, if you have a moment. Sure. The question was, how can woodpeckers tell if the tree is healthy? That is a good question. And I don't know, so I'm totally guessing here. But I think it would be a tree that you know, the bark is intact. It's got big, vibrant, healthy leaves. Uh, yeah, I think does, they would. And does it hurt the tree at all when the woodpecker drills holes into it? It can, absolutely. Yep, they, okay. what the woodpeckers do is they speed up the rot in the forest. It's, it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it just is, but it's part of the, the cycle. Everything has a life cycle, so woodpeckers, uh, in that need for finding a cavity, they make homes for other animals. Does it harm the tree? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we are going to wrap this up. But again, thank you for, especially for sharing an original story with us. That's wonderful. Um, next week is our last one, and we're hoping everyone can join us. It's the legend of the Western Hemlock. So uh, all of you visit the Facebook account and register again, and I'm off to supper, which will not be what the woodpeckers are eating. And again, have a great night, everyone. Bye for now.